Welcome back to Intermediate Accounting. This video concludes our discussion of Chapter 16, Dilutive Securities and Earnings Per Share. And this video focuses on diluted earnings per share. What you see here is an overview of what we're going to be calculating today with diluted earnings per share. Diluted earnings per share begins with basic earnings per share, which we're familiar with. And then it adjusts for the impact of convertible debt and convertible preferred stock onto diluted earnings per share, and also the impact of exercising employee stock options onto diluted earnings per share. Next, let's take out uh, your pens and some paper and let's start taking some notes. A complex capital structure is one where a company has convertible securities or employee stock options and warrants. In other words, the company has securities that can be converted at the holder's discretion into shares of common stock. And why is that an issue for common stockholders? Well, they say, if all of those other securities did get converted, what would that do to my earnings per share? So again, they exist when the company has convertible securities. Remember, there's two types of convertible securities that we've talked about, convertible bonds and convertible preferred stock as well as employee stock options and warrants. We're gonna use options and warrants interchangeably because uh, for our purposes, they're basically the same thing. That upon conversion or exercise, these items could dilute earnings per share. What do we be mean by diluting earnings per share? Well, if earnings per share is net income minus preferred dividends, divided by the number of shares outstanding, Diluted EPS says, what if, what about the worst case scenario? What would these earnings per share look like if every holder of the convertible bonds, convertible preferred stock and employee stock options did exercise their conversion right and turn those securities into additional shares of common stock? Because if we increase the denominator in this earnings per share, what happens to overall earnings per share? Overall earnings per share would go down because now we're spreading the profit over more shareholders. And don't forget that both basic earnings per share, where we're not using this what if everything was exercised and what if new shares were given out, and diluted earnings per share, which we're going to see in this video, which does account for what if on the earliest date possible of this year, all of these holders of convertible securities did convert and the company had to issue new shares of common stock. Both basic and diluted earnings per share are reported on the face of the income statement. Again, here's this visual where we see earnings per share in the usual formula that we know. And when we're calculating diluted earnings per share, we start with the basic earnings per share and then we also adjust for the impact of converting convertible bonds into common stock, preferred stock into common stock, and converting options warrants into shares of common stock. We use the if convertitive method. I like to call this the what is the worst possible thing that could happen to me as a common stockholder? What's the worst thing that could happen to my uh, earnings per share calculation? Well, the worst thing that could happen is if everybody who had a convertible security did convert it, it dilutes my ownership and therefore my uh, entitlement to those profits. The if converted method assumes for a convertible bond, assumes conversion at the beginning of the period. Assuming that the security was uh, was outstanding the entire period, or if this, let's say, convertible bond was issued partway through the year, June 1st, then we couldn't assume that it was converted on January 1st because we didn't have that security. Then we would say it was outstanding, it was assumed converted on the date that it was issued, it was issued this year. If we didn't have the convertible bond, instead it was converted and we had the stock instead, what else do we need to do? We need to eliminate the related interest expense. Not only that, so think about your income statement being revenues minus uh, 
all expenses are operating expenses and then minus the interest expense and then minus income tax expense. So from here we would get the subtotal pre-tax income or income before taxes. And then from that we would subtract out income tax expense to get to net income. Well, because interest expense reduces pre-tax income, there's actually a tax benefit for the the for interest expense. So when we eliminate interest expense, we don't just want to add back the interest expense that the company would not have incurred if they didn't have the bond, they had the common stock. We also want to do that net of taxes. Let's take a look at an example of convertible bonds. In 2019, Chirac Enterprises issued at par $61,000 face value bonds they have an 8% stated interest rate. Each bond is convertible into 100 shares of common stock. That was issued last year. Throughout this year, 2020, 2,000 shares of common stock were outstanding. None of the bonds were converted or redeemed. The company had net income in 2020, the current year of 2580, assume the tax rate of 40%. We are asked to calculate diluted earnings per share for 2020 first, and then set, we're gonna run through the example again, assuming that instead of the bonds having been outstanding the entire year 2020, let's assume that the bonds were issued partway through this year, September 1st. Let's start with part A, computing diluted earnings per share, knowing that the bonds were outstanding the entire year. When we're calculating diluted earnings per share, we're always gonna start with the basic earnings per share calculation. So we have our net income minus preferred dividends on the top and the weekly average shares outstanding on the bottom. We're gonna start with our basic earnings per share calculation. So net income, uh, there are no preferred dividends here, so that'll just be zero. And the net income we are told is 2,580, no preferred dividends. We're gonna continue on, but I'm gonna have a little break here for just focusing on what is the earnings, the basic earnings per share portion of my diluted earnings per share. So this whole amount that we work through here is going to give me my diluted earnings per share. And a component of that we see here is the basic earnings per share. So the example says there were 2,000 shares of common stock issued and outstanding all year. So this is divided by 2,000 shares, basic earnings per share is would work out to be $1.29. Now to get to diluted earnings per share, we need to make some adjustments. We are going to add back the interest expense. Included in this 2580 of net income is interest expense, right? Interest expense has been subtracted out before we get to this bottom line net, net income 2580. And that interest expense was reduced by income tax expenses. So if we didn't have, we had a benefit for the income taxes because pre-tax income was lower when we have interest expense. If we didn't have the bonds, we wouldn't have had that income tax benefit. So what we wanna do is we take the amount of bond interest on an after-tax basis. So I'm gonna account for after-tax bond interest expense. I'm not told directly what the bond interest expense is, but I can calculate that. There are 60 bonds, 1,000 face value for each bond. So total face value of $60,000 for these bonds. And they have a stated interest rate of 8%. So that would give me my the net amount of the interest expense, and we want this on an after-tax basis. So what is the amount after tax is one minus the tax rate, and the tax rate we're told is 40%. So this whole term is going to work out to be 2,880. That is the after-tax impact of the interest expense. We're gonna add that back to net income, and then for the denominator, we, we again, we are assuming that these bonds were converted into shares of common stock as of the beginning of the year because they were out, they were issued last year, they are outstanding all year. So when these 60 bonds were converted, how many additional shares? Each bond was convertible into 60 shares. So 
we have 60 bonds, sorry, each of these 60 bonds is convertible into 100 shares of common stock. So we ended up issuing, or we would have issued, a total of 6,000 additional shares of common stock. So what does this work out to? 2580 plus 2880 divided by 2,000 shares plus an additional 6,000 shares of common stock. This works out to diluted EPS equal to 68 cents. Now let's go to part B. We had previously assumed that the bonds were outstanding all year. What if the bonds had been issued partway through the year? So now if the bonds had been issued on September 1st, how would that change our calculation? We're going to start with the same net income minus preferred dividends, our same basic earnings per share calculation. Let's put in our basic earnings per share. We're not going to see any differences in, in, from our last example. Net income was 25.80 minus zero. No preferred dividends. 2,000 based on 2,000 shares outstanding. So we still get the basic earnings per share that we had before of $1.29. Now let's do our adjustment. It's very similar to what we did before. The 60 bonds, we have to think about what was in what was interest expense if the bonds had been issued on September 1st. Then interest expense, the money was uh, outstanding incurring the cost of interest for September, October, November, and December. So we want to add that back, 60 bonds times a 100 face value, 1,000 face value per bond, 8% stated rate. But now let's allocate that simply for the September, October, November, December, four out of 12 months that the bonds were actually outstanding and incurring interest. And then just like we did before, let's find that on an after-tax basis. So one minus the tax rate of 40%. This whole term works out to be 960. And again, if the uh, shares had been converted, there's one difference. We can't take the total amount of 6,000 that we had here. This 6,000 assumes that the bonds were converted on January 1st. But now we have to get the weighted average amount of common shares that we would have the conversion of those bonds on September 1st. Just like before, we have the 60 bonds. Each bond is convertible into 100 shares. But we can't stop at that 6,000 because these were not outstanding the entire year. So we have to convert this into the fraction of the year or allocate it to the portion of the year that they were outstanding. So these shares would have been outstanding from September 1st through December 31st. So we need to multiply this by 4 out of 12. And this term here, we're adding to the 2,000, we are adding an additional 2,000 shares. So we got a total of 2580 plus 960. divided by 4,000 shares. And this gives us diluted earnings per share of $1.37. Now let's take a look at an example of convertible preferred stock. Prior to 2020, Barclay Company issued 40,000 shares of 6% convertible cumulative preferred stock with a $100 par value. Each share is convertible into five shares of common stock. Net income for 2020 was 1.2 million. There were 600,000 common shares outstanding during 2020. There were no changes during 2020 in the number of common or preferred shares outstanding. Now, when we're computing, di computing diluted earnings per share, we're assuming as of the earliest date possible, so these shares, the preferred stock was outstanding all year because they were issued in a prior year. We're assuming as of January 1st, all of these shares of preferred stock were converted into common stock. So what would that do to our basic earnings per share calculation? If we didn't have any preferred stock, then we would no longer have any 
preferred dividends. So that affects the numerator by we do no longer need to subtract out the preferred dividends. And what does it do to the denominator? In addition to having the existing 600,000 common shares, we also increase that by the number of common shares we would have upon conversion of the preferred So let's work this out together. Let me calculate our diluted earnings per share. We're assuming that all preferred stock was converted into common stock at the earliest date possible, which would be January 1st. So our numerator is 1.2 million, which is the net income. And there would be no dividends. So we can completely ignore preferred dividends. Why? Well, if this stock was preferred stock was converted, we're assuming it was converted on January 1st, then we can completely ignore uh, any preferred dividends. We start with our initial 600,000 shares of common stock that actually were outstanding, and then we need to adjust it. Here's our adjustment. If these sh preferred shares had been converted at the earliest date possible, how many additional common shares would be outstanding? We have 40,000 shares of preferred stock. And each share of preferred is convertible. Conversion ratio is the conversion rate is into five shares of common. This is our conversion rate. So we have how many additional shares? If we had, if all our preferred stockholders had converted at the beginning of the year, we would have an additional 200,000 shares of stock. So our denominator we can see here is 800,000. The numerator is $1.2 million, so our diluted earnings per share is $1.60. Let's move on to our third type of convertible security or dilutive security, options and warrants. Remember, we're taking these together as if for our purposes, they're the same thing. What happens when our employees exercise their stock options? We measure the dilutive effect of potential conversion using the treasury stock method. So if 100 options are exercised, we don't just add the 100 shares to the denominator as our adjustment. What we do is we assume that when the options or warrants are exercised at the beginning of the year, the company then uses the cash received upon exercise to purchase common stock from the for the treasury. Let's take a look at a very simple example. Assume that when options are exercised, the company must first purchase those shares as treasury stock. Let's say two options are exercised at an exercise price of $5 each. So the company is receiving $10. The market price of the stock is also $10. So how much can the company afford to take out of existing outstanding stock, put into treasury, and then issue to have it outstanding again by issuing it to the employee? Only one share because the amount of cash received can only afford to buy one share of stock. The company then needs to issue one additional, we call this in one incremental share. It's actually these incremental shares, not the total number that are given upon exercise, but the incremental shares that is used as the adjustment in the denominator of the earnings per share calculation or the, number, the weighted average common shares outstanding. Let's take, let's write down our formula that we're going to use to determine the number of incremental shares that are, that must be used as an adjustment in the EPS denominator. Two steps. The first step is going to be the number of shares that can be purchased using the, proce using the proceeds. or in other words, the cash that's received by the company from the exercise of the options. And that's going to be equal to the number of options that are exercised times the exercise price per option. Divide that by the average market price. So here we have exercise price denominator, average market price. And that average market price will be, in our examples, they'll be given. And when you're actually doing this as an accountant, that market price is just 
what the market price was, we can just download that uh, data from the internet. Okay, and then two, step two, take the number of shares needed because options were exercised. Those options multiplied by any sort of conversion rate or conversion ratio needed. And less, so then from that we subtract the number of shares that can be purchased, what we found in step one. Purchased using the proceeds. And that gives us the number of incremental shares. And there's another way that we can solve for this. We can solve for the number of incremental shares. If this is easier for you, you can do it this way. Take the difference between the market price of the stock and the option price or the exercise price. Let's try to use these. I'm going to try to write down the terms how I wrote them before. Exercise price of the option, which is also called the option price, and divide that by the market price of the stock. Let's multiply this whole term by the number of options that were exercised. So again, this is a second method. We can either use what we saw on the previous slide or this formula to determine the number of incremental shares, which is our adjustment in getting to diluted earnings per share once option, when, when we're assuming that options are exercised. All right, let's take a look at an example. So brand new company's net income for 2020 is 40,000. The only potentially dilutive securities outstanding were 1,000 options issued during 2019 last period. Each option is exercisable for one share of stock at $8. None of the options were exercised and 10,000 shares of common stock were outstanding throughout the year 2020. The average market price of the stock during this year 2020 was $20 per share. Let's start with A, compute diluted earnings per share. In computing diluted earnings per share, the adjustment that we need is the incremental share calculation. So let's solve for this using each of the two methods we just saw. So if we want to do the two-step method, we say take the cash proceeds, and divide that by the average market price. So when these options are exercised, how much cash does the company get? We have 1,000 options that are issued. It, remember, we are assuming we're taking that worst case scenario that everyone exercised their options at a price of $8. So the company receives $8,000 in cash. Divide that by the average market price of the stock, which is 20. And so what we get is 400. We can take the cash that we receive upon issuance and we can buy 400 shares from Treasury and then reissue those to our employees so that there's no change in the number of shares outstanding. Why does the number of shares outstanding change? Because in step two, we still need, we need a total of 1,000 shares because we have 1,000 options and each is converted, can be converted into one share. So this is, don't forget your conversion ratio here, it's easy, but you get five shares for every one option, we would multiply by five. We need 1,000 shares, but we were able to buy 400 shares, so less, the 400 we calculated in step one. The number of incremental shares is 600. We need to issue an additional 600 shares. And so that will be our adjustment in the denominator. That's one way to get to the number of incremental shares of 600. What's the other method? We take the difference between the market price of the stock or the average market price of 20 and the exercise price, or also called the option price, and divide that by the market price, then multiply this whole term by the number of options that were exercised, or the number of shares that we need to be giving out. So 12 over 20 times 1,000. Either way, we're going to get to 600 incremental shares. We still need to calculate diluted earnings per share. Diluted earnings per share is equal to the company's net income minus any preferred dividends, and there isn't any preferred dividends. 
So although if this is if they were preferred stock and it was convertible, we would need to adjust for that as well. We're not going to see conversion of options plus convertible bonds or preferreds in the same example. So our numerator will stay the same. Net income was 40,000. We were told that there are 10,000 shares of common stock outstanding, and we need to adjust it, add the additional 600 incremental shares. So 40,000 divided by 10,600, this is gonna give us an earnings per share of $3.77. Now, let's assume that the 1,000 options were issued on October 1st, 2020. So they were not outstanding the entire year. What changes here? Well, we wouldn't have the full 600 incremental shares. That was if it was in for outstanding for the entire year. We would just need to prorate that 600 for the period that those options were outstanding or in other words, the earliest date they could have been converted, which would have been October 1st. So diluted earnings per share would be very similar to what we just had. The numerator would still be the $40,000 of net income. Divide this by, we have the initial, the, the real 10,000 shares that were outstanding. And then we prorate the 600 incremental shares times a portion of the year, earliest the earliest amount of time that those shares could have been converted. The earliest was October 1st, so they could have been converted to additional shares October, November, December, three out of 12 months. So this term works out to be 150 incremental shares. So 40,000 of net income divided by 10,150 shares gives us diluted earnings per share of $3.94. The last point to note is anti-dilution. Anti-dilutive securities are those that when we're doing our worst case scenario and saying, let's assume every convertible security turned into additional shares of common stock. If when we do our calculations, diluted earnings per share is higher than basic earnings per share, then we would ignore dilutive earnings per share. So let's fill in these notes. Dilutive securities are those that if assumed converted to common stock would increase diluted earnings per share. So we diluted earnings per share can only be less than basic earnings per share. It can never be higher because we always are taking this worst case scenario view. We're not going to say best case scenario. And if it works out when we do our diluted earnings per share calculation that these convertible securities are anti-dilutive, they increase earnings per share, then we ignore them. So we ignore anti-dilutive securities in all calculations. And what that means is if diluted earnings per share is greater than basic earnings per share, we don't report any diluted earnings per share. We simply just report basic earnings per share. This concludes our discussion of chapter 16 and convertible securities, convertible bonds, convertible preferreds, and the exercise of employee stock options.